In one of our recent videos, we discussed atomic batteries, power sources capable of providing energy to various low-power electronic devices for decades without replacement or recharging. We mentioned that the key drawback of such batteries, scientifically referred to as beta voltaic elements, is their very low power output, typically measured in thousandths of a watt at best. However, today there exist devices capable of delivering tens of thousands of times more power over the same decades-long period. These are known as radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs. In today's video, we'll delve into the physical principles underlying their operation, existing RTG models and their applications, as well as the challenges and prospects of this technology. So subscribe to the channel and let's explore further. Unlike beta voltaic elements, which utilize beta radioactive isotopes emitting rapidly moving electrons, RTGs and related devices harness the energy of another process, alpha decay, in which massive nuclei effectively eject alpha particles, essentially helium atom nuclei consisting of two protons and two neutrons. While the release of energy from the beta decay of, for example, nickel-63 amounts to only about 70,000 electron volts per decay, alpha decay yields millions of electron volts per decay. Furthermore, while a significant portion of the energy released in beta decay is carried away by elusive neutrinos and is not useful, in alpha decay, this energy is almost entirely released as kinetic energy of the alpha particle. Alpha particles have relatively large mass and size and thus do not propagate well through matter and rapidly transfer their kinetic energy to other atoms. Essentially, the energy from alpha decay is released as heat. In highly active substances such as plutonium, this heating is intense enough to make them glow. Heat can be efficiently converted into electricity and currently, there are several methods of such conversion, with direct thermoelectric conversion based on the Seebeck effect being the most common. In essence, a thermoelectric converter based on the Seebeck effect consists of two conductors made of different metals. Hence, such constructions are also called thermocouples. If a temperature difference is applied between the ends of the thermocouple by heating one end and cooling the other, or both simultaneously, an electric current will begin to flow through the thermocouple. To understand how this works, let's first consider one of the conductors of the thermocouple and observe what happens inside it when there is a temperature difference between its ends. As is known, the conductivity of metallic conductors is explained by the presence of numerous free electrons inside them. This electron medium is often called an electron gas since the behavior of electrons in it is similar in many respects to the behavior of molecules in ordinary gas. And we know what happens to gas molecules when heated. They begin to move faster, which increases the pressure in the gas. As the pressure increases, gases expand and their density decreases. Essentially, the same thing happens with the electron gas. In the heated part of the conductor, it expands, reducing its density, and some electrons from the heated part of the conductor are displaced to the cooler part, where the density of the electron gas increases. In other words, in the heated part of the conductor, the electron concentration decreases compared to the normal state, while in the cooler part, it increases. In normal conditions, the conductor is uncharged because the negative charge of the electron gas is compensated by the positive charge of the metal lattice ions. Accordingly, after heating and redistributing the electron gas inside the conductor, we will have a situation where a negative charge is formed on its cold side, where some electrons have migrated, and a positive charge is formed on the hot side, where there is a deficit of electrons. Thus, an electric potential difference will arise between the ends of the conductor. This electric potential difference by itself will not lead to the flow of current, as it arose due to internal processes within the conductor. One might say that the electric potential difference will be balanced by the pressure difference of the electron gas. However, if we now connect the ends of our conductor to another conductor in which electrons are uniformly distributed, then for this conductor, this potential difference will already be external and a current will flow through it. More precisely, not quite. The ends of the second conductor will heat up just like the ends of the first one, and if they are made of the same material, the situation will be exactly symmetric and no current will flow. 
But if we use a conductor made of a different metal, let's say with a lower electron concentration, to connect them, the situation will change. Indeed, the electron gas pressure at its hot end will also be higher than at the cold end. But these pressures themselves will be lower than in the first conductor, and the resulting difference in electron gas pressures will no longer be able to resist the tendency of the field to equalize the difference in electrical potentials. An electric current will flow through the thermocouple. Actually, as always, in videos on our channel, this is a somewhat simplified description of the effect. In reality, things are a bit more complex and interesting. For example, there is also the effect of so-called electron phonon drag, which sometimes can play a more significant role in everything that happens than what we discussed above. However, explaining it is a bit more complicated, as we would first need to explain what phonons are and why they are needed. So in this video, we'll stick to what we've already discussed. The magnitude of the potential difference between the hot and cold ends of the thermocouple will depend on the temperature difference between the ends. So by measuring the voltage in it, which we can do quite accurately, we can determine this difference. Thanks to this, thermocouples are used today as fast and accurate electrical thermometers, especially effective in measuring high temperatures. However, the potential difference in the thermocouple can also be used to obtain an electric current, and it is this method of application that will interest us today. Thermocouples made of semiconductor materials are also common. The principle is almost the same. Two semiconductors, N-type and P-type, are connected by a metallic conductor. Next, one end of the semiconductor thermocouple is heated, while the other is cooled. Here it is important to remember that in an N-type semiconductor, charge carriers, much like in metal, are free electrons, while in a P-type semiconductor, there are vacancies for electrons in the crystal lattice, which are called holes. When heated, free electrons in the N-type semiconductor will behave essentially the same as electrons in metal. They will be pushed into the conductor, and as a result, electrons from the conductor will be pushed into the P-type semiconductor where they will recombine with holes, occupying vacant positions in the crystal lattice. As a result, a shortage of electrons will occur in the N-type semiconductor, i.e. a positive charge will form, and in the P-type semiconductor, conversely, a negative charge will form due to the excess of electrons. Consequently, once again, a potential difference will arise. Thermoelectric elements have several undeniable advantages. Firstly, they are relatively simple and inexpensive to manufacture, but most importantly, they have no moving parts. And if there are no moving parts, there is nothing to break. Therefore, the reliability of such power sources will be significantly higher than that of other devices that convert heat into other forms of energy. For example, conventional heat engines. However, there are also downsides, the main one being the extremely low efficiency which usually amounts to a few percent of the heat energy generated. For comparison, classical electric generators based on internal combustion engines have an efficiency of about 30 to 40 percent. And for turbine generators, this figure can reach 60 percent. So it is not surprising that thermoelectric converters have not gained wide acceptance as energy generators for household or industrial purposes and are unlikely to do so in the future. Although there are projects to use thermoelectric converters for heat recovery, which is a byproduct in, for example, the metallurgical industry. Nevertheless, in the second half of the 20th century, thermoelectric elements were remembered at a time when humanity needed power sources capable of reliably and continuously operating for many years. Primarily, we are talking about spacecraft, which sometimes cannot be serviced after launch. But the need for such devices also existed on Earth. For example, they were required for the uninterrupted operation of various autonomous weather stations and other similar facilities located in remote areas. And it was for solving these tasks that thermoelectric elements were simply irreplaceable. Simple, relatively inexpensive, and most importantly, reliable, like a piece of metal, which is exactly what they are. I suppose you've already guessed that alpha radioactive isotopes decay that's how RTGs, or radioisotope thermoelectric generators, were created. It is such devices that supplied and continue to supply energy to various lunar rovers and Mars rovers. And they still sustain the operation of probes sent deep into space like the Pioneers or Voyagers. 
Simplicity, reliability, and durability are the main advantages of RTGs, but these advantages largely end there. The key problem remains the low efficiency, which requires a sufficiently powerful heat source to obtain acceptable electrical power, meaning the use of a large amount of nuclear fuel. We're talking about kilograms if we're talking about plutonium-238, and tens of kilograms if we're talking about uranium-235, just to obtain hundreds or even tens of watts of electrical power. Considering that the cost of one kilogram of plutonium-238 is about $2.5 million, it becomes clear that reliability and durability come at a considerable cost. The device ends up being quite large and massive. For example, a modern American GPHS RTG like those installed on probes like Galileo, Cassini, and New Horizons weighs 57 kilograms and is a cylinder 1 meter and 14 centimeters long with a diameter of 42 centimeters. The device only provides about 300 watts of electrical power, not enough to power even an electric kettle. Moreover, the cost of the device is $118 million. I think you've already understood that RTGs are definitely not suitable for widespread use. However, in their field of uninterrupted power supply for various hard-to-reach devices, they simply have no competitors. Well, except for similar next-generation devices that are currently being developed in various countries around the world. These devices are often also called RTGs. Although this is not entirely correct, since they use not direct thermoelectric conversion through the Seebeck effect, but fundamentally different mechanisms. What mechanisms are we talking about? Currently, work is underway in various countries in several directions. For example, NASA proposes to use a radioisotope heat source in conjunction with a so-called Stirling engine, capable of converting thermal energy into mechanical energy and then this mechanical energy will be converted into electricity using conventional electromechanical generators. The Stirling engine is a fairly simple device, a type of so-called external combustion engines. There are several types of Stirling engines. Here, we will consider the operation of a so-called beta-type Stirling engine. Such an engine consists of a cylinder with two pistons inside attached to a common flywheel. The first piston, called the working piston, fits tightly against the cylinder walls, while there is a gap between the second piston, also called the displacer, and the cylinder walls. Heat is supplied to the left side of the cylinder from the heating element, in our case, the radioisotope heater, while the right side is cooled, for example, using a conventional radiator, providing heat exchange with the surrounding environment. The heat source heats the gas, increasing its pressure, and the gas begins to expand, flowing around the displacer piston and pushing the working piston to the right. As the working piston moves, it rotates the flywheel, which causes the displacer piston to move to the left. Displacing in this way, the displacer piston performs its main function. It displaces the gas from the hot part of the cylinder to the cold part. Here, the gas cools down and compresses, causing the working piston to move to the left. As a result of this movement, the flywheel rotates again, shifting the displacer piston to the right, causing the cooled gas to move back into the hot part of the vessel, and the cycle repeats. Thus, the thermal energy supplied from the radioisotope heater is converted into mechanical energy, which can then be used to obtain what we need, electricity. More precisely, NASA proposes to attach permanent magnets to the working piston and surround the area where it moves with a coil of wire. Moving inside the coil, the magnets create an alternating magnetic field, which induces eddy currents in the coil, thereby generating electricity. The overall efficiency of the device reaches an impressive 25%, which is three to four times higher than that of standard RTGs, which means at least that with a device of the same power, you can use three to four times less expensive fuel or get three to four times more power with the same amount of radioactive material. NASA plans to use radioisotope Stirling generators both as power sources for long-range space missions and for energy supply, for example, for permanent bases on other planets like the Moon or Mars. It looks quite interesting, although such systems will inevitably face all the problems typical of Stirling engines, such as relatively large installation mass. And most importantly, unlike traditional RTGs, radioisotope Stirling generators still have moving parts, which reduces their reliability and service life. 
However, NASA is confident that the system is still reliable enough for use in space. For example, one of the prototypes of such devices, the so-called Technology Demonstration Unit 13, worked continuously from 2003 to 2017, and when it was stopped and disassembled, no clear signs of degradation threatening its operability were found. So NASA specialists have grounds for their claims that radioisotope Stirling generators, or as they are also called, dynamic radioisotope systems, have a service life of at least 15 years, which is more than enough to solve many tasks. Russia has taken a different path. In 2023, the National Research Nuclear University presented a relatively compact source capable of delivering electrical power of several tens of watts. It uses a different principle of converting heat into electricity, based on the so-called thermophotovoltaic effect. The essence of it is as follows. Infrared electromagnetic radiation emitted by a heated radioactive core is captured by a special capsule whose walls are coated with a special material capable of converting infrared radiation into visible light. This light is then directed onto photovoltaic cells, or in simpler terms, miniature solar panels, which directly generate electricity. The thermophotovoltaic effect in which special materials convert infrared, i.e., Long wavelength radiation into electromagnetic radiation of higher frequency and shorter wavelength is a tremendously interesting topic actively researched today in many countries around the world. Its use, for example, can significantly increase the efficiency of solar panels by converting the infrared component of solar light, which is useless for classical photovoltaic elements, into visible light, which by the way accounts for about 50% of all its energy. As a result, according to calculations, the efficiency of solar panels due to this can be increased to 80% compared to the current 20 or slightly more. Although so far, only about 40% has been achieved in the best prototypes, and much more work will be needed to even launch such panels into mass production. In general, this is an extremely impressive and promising technology, behind which, Unfortunately, lies very challenging physics of nanostructured materials. I think this topic deserves a separate video, and if you found it interesting, don't forget to write about it in the comments. Well, in our case, the thermophotovoltaic effect was invented to utilize nuclear heat. Developers claim that they have achieved an efficiency of conversion of about 15%, a little less than in American radioisotope Stirling generators, but there are no moving parts in the device, which provides greater reliability and a longer service life, at least 20 to 30 years. By using various types of radioactive material, it is possible to vary the power and service life. For example, the power source can be fueled with thorium-228, which has a half-life of just under two years, but emits a whopping 26 watts of thermal energy per gram, or a Mauritium-241, which gives only 0.11 watts per gram, but has a half-life of over 400 years. However, the most promising is considered the golden mean in the form of plutonium-238 with a half-life of 88 years and energy release of 0.56 watts per gram. In this case, the output electrical power should be about 10 watts. Radioisotope sources from MIFI are planned to be used for powering automatic weather stations, for example, in the Arctic, or for telemetry sensors for oil and gas pipelines. In conclusion, let's consider the question that always inevitably arises whenever we talk about something radioactive. How safe is all this in general? The situation here is somewhat ambivalent. On the one hand, pure alpha emitters are quite safe. As we already mentioned above, alpha particles have low penetrating ability and will be completely absorbed inside the device's casing. On the other hand, during decay, many alpha radioactive isotopes transform into other radioactive substances, including those giving off hard beta radiation, i.e. streams of high energy electrons. Beta radiation itself is also quite easy to shield, but both during the beta decay process and as a result of slowing down high energy electrons by matter, gamma radiation, which cannot be retained inside a compact device, is often emitted. So initially, RTGs are practically not dangerous from a radioactive point of view, but the further we go, the more they begin to buzz. If we are talking about something that we sent into space, then it is not particularly crucial. But on Earth, 
This will be one of the problems that developers and users of these products will certainly have to deal with. In general, RTGs, whether old or new, cannot be called completely safe. In summary, it can be noted that alpha radio isotope generators are unlikely to find widespread use in everyday life or commercial activities, but they have been, are, and will be highly demanded in certain narrow but nonetheless important spheres for humanity. So work in this direction is very relevant and will certainly continue to be actively pursued by specialists around the world.